Hello, good morning and welcome to the 2010 Clinical Nutritional Seminar. My name is Rama Garimala and I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of Dietetics and Nutrition. And uh, Dr. Sullivan and uh, Teacher Baxter gave me an opportunity to be a moderator for this session and I thank you very much for entrusting me with this responsibility. We have a very distinguished panel of speakers and uh, as Dr. Sullivan was mentioning, uh, in the light of uh, this uh, paper, Bolin's article about calcium, supplement, uh, ca calcium supplements and risk for cardiovascular diseases, we thought it's timely to get a perspective from a cardiologist, endocrinologist and a dietitian and specifically it will be very useful for uh, practicing dietitians and how, uh, you know, this whole thing would change the practice or how to interpret some of these findings. So it's my extreme pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. James Watek, an eminent cardiologist uh, from the University of Kansas Medical Center Hospital and Mid-America Cardiology. Dr. Watek uh, is, has been in this field over 28 years from now, I think and has been involved actively in clinical investigation and research in the area of vitamin D deficiency and uh, cardiovascular diseases. So, and he has published over about 180 abstracts and peer-reviewed articles, research articles, and uh, is a leader in uh, clinical uh, research relating to cardiovascular health and disease. So today, He's going to talk about vitamin D in cardiovascular health and disease. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wachek. Thank you very much for the most gracious introduction and the opportunity to, to be part of the um, symposium. I was really excited to be asked to be involved because I think this is a terribly important topic and um, to give you an overview of it so you can know when you can tune in or tune out or, or, or get some vitamin rich foods, uh, vitamin D rich foods in the middle of it. I'll, I'll kind of give you an overview of where things, um, how we're going to work. Well, first of all, I should mention that the um, this was done, a lot of the, the research aspects was done as, as part of a Master of Science degree in clinical research, which I just completed here with KU, the School of Preventive Medicine. Wonderful experience. I really encourage it to anybody looking for an advanced degree. It's part of, part of the spectrum of postgraduate degrees you can work on, like a Master of Public Health, but if you're really interested in some of the biostatistical aspects, uh, they have a terrific program here. And so um, much of what I'll present in regards to my research project was part of my master's thesis. Um, you noticed on the picture that was shown, and I, I didn't have a beard. I've had a beard on and off for years. It used to be nice and dark and black and then started to match my age. But when I started the degree program, I was in, and I was not only older than every other student in the program, I was older than every professor in the program. <laughs> So I shaved the beard off to at least pretend that I was a little bit younger for a while, but I don't think I fooled anyone. Um, a couple of sayings from very wise people that relate to how we should maybe look at science, health, nutrients. Uh, Albert Einstein said, the whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. Thomas Jefferson, one of our nation's founding fathers, we have had for three weeks past a warm visit from the sun, my almighty physician, and I find myself almost reestablished. So uh, Tom Jefferson knew that there was something good about sunlight. And I remember my mom, when I'd be sitting and reading a Tom Swift book or Hardy Boy book or something, she'd say, get outside and get some sun. It's good for you. And she was probably right. Vitamin D and cardiovascular disease. Well, cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of mortality and morbidity in the United States and probably worldwide, particularly as more and more nations westernize. Um, and we're going to find that cardiovascular diseases overtake infectious diseases and trauma as causes of mortality and morbidity. Recent evidence supports an association of vitamin D deficiency with hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, 
metabolic syndrome, coronary artery disease, and heart failure. And these aren't speculative associations. These have, been, these have been established in many, many research articles over the last 15 to 20 years in very prestigious journals. So don't let an overview statement maybe dissuade you from the reality that there has been a lot of research going into these associations. And I feel that vitamin D deficiency is emerging as a major cardiovascular risk factor. So I wanted to start with as an overview, again, kind of a background of vitamin D metabolism, how it relates to cardiovascular health. The middle segment will be our research project that looked at this, and then we'll close up kind of an overview of where I think vitamin D ought to be implemented into our dietary intake, and maybe a, um, a brief overview of the recent in, uh, Institute of Medicine statement. Vitamin D, as you know, belongs to a group of steroid molecules traditionally associated with bone and calcium metabolism. And up until five years ago, that's really how I thought about vitamin D. There's five different forms. In most cases, vitamin D2 and D3 are those that are most applicable to uh, our health. Um, so these are the five different types, but D2 and D3 are the focus of our interest. These are what the molecules look like. Seprosteroid really just means that there's one double bond missing in a steroid uh, ring. But in uh, but other cases, there's actually a lot of um, anal analogies to uh, cholesterol molecules. This, most of you know from your studies, from your work, that uh, there are two sources of vitamin D in humans. There is uh, a conversion by solar radiation dietary intake, uh, the vitamin D from whatever mechanism, the gut uptake or from conversion in the skin, uh, latches on to D-binding protein, goes to the liver where it is 25-hydroxylated, then proceeds to the kidney where it is 125-dihydroxylated, uh, di uh, and then it has multiple roles in regards to promoting calcium and phosphorus absorption. Uh, assuring that bone health is appropriate, and there are very elegant feedback loops involving gut uptake, bone metabolism, the parathyroid gland that it promotes homeostasis and a balance of calcium and phosphorus levels, as well as the degree of vitamin D conversion in the liver and in the kidney. Ergocosifrol, or vitamin D2, is principally synthesized in plants and vertebrates and consumed in the human diet and as supplements and fortified products. Interestingly, though, when I looked at most recent supplement bottles, I think that vitamin D3 is probably the most uh, common form in most supplements nowadays. And maybe it probably relates to cost as much as anything else. Vitamin D3 is primarily of vertebrate animal origin and commonly consumed from oily fish. Also synthesized in the skin uh, after exposure of a precursor to solar ultraviolet radiation. Something that I really didn't realize to researching the topic, but only about 10 to 20 percent of vitamin D comes from dietary intake. It's tough to get enough vitamin D from dietary intake unless you focus on supplemented foods. And I know that more and more foods are being supplemented with higher levels. But up until a few years back, even though you may think you were drinking vitamin D fortified milk, you'd have to drink a ton of milk to get enough vitamin D. Uh, most, 80 to 90 percent, in, in almost all people, come from a cutaneous conversion, so, sunlight exposure, in other words. So I mentioned before, the liver converts vitamin D to 25 hydroxy vitamin D in the weight limiting step, the kidneys convert 25 hydroxy vitamin D to the active form 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And again, this is a simplified flow chart of how that happens, again, demonstrating the uh, 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 intake both from skin conversion and GI uptake, um, initial metabolism in the liver, and then subsequent to the active form in the kidneys. Um, it ends up that uh, most serum measurements and most people uh, measure the 25-hydroxy form. We've known for years about the non-cardiovascular effects, primarily calcium phosphorus absorption, reabsorption, uh, bone mineralization, as I mentioned before. But of interest in more recent years are the cardiovascular aspects. Uh, that vitamin D appears to be related to uh, blood pressure, vascular resistance, uh, intermal thickness of the arteries, 
sensitivity and secretion of insulin, uh, uh, lipid levels, uh, myocardial contractility, and also reduction of inflammatory cytokines. One of the pathways by which coronary artery plaques become unstable and can induce unstable uh, cardiac events such as sudden cardiac death and myocardial infarction. As I mentioned, CM25, vitamin D is a major circulating metabolite and reflects vitamin D input from cutaneous and dietary intake. The 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is the biologically active form. It's regarded as the best. Um, it ends up that measurements are primarily the 25 hydroxy form and the best indicator of vitamin D status in individuals without kidney disease. Well, how much of a problem is this? And I guess it, it depends on your vantage point and how you look at it. And like anything else, where you define the cutoff levels, right? Uh, the epidemi epidemiology of vitamin D deficiency includes high prevalence in the elderly, the institutionalized, and those above the 37th parallel in the United States. In other words, the further north you are, the lower your vitamin D levels are likely to be due to decreased continuous exposure. Worldwide deficiency is estimated to be 30 to 50 percent, with the prevalence in this country estimated to be 25 to 57 percent, depending on the population studied. So it's a major problem. There's a lot of people who are vitamin D deficient based on what has what have been standard and commonly recognized levels over the years. You can imagine that if you reduce the threshold level for what deficiency might be, you're going to drop those uh, prevalence values, but that may not be fair. Well, guess where Kansas City is? Kansas City indeed is above the 37th parallel, and a major portion of the U.S. population lives above that uh, level. You know, the reality is mankind, for most of our history, we were outside, we were on the move, we didn't spend much time inside, we had to be hunter-gatherers, we probably lived primarily in warmer climates, we probably wore fewer clothes than we do now on the average. And um, in general, I suspect that for most of mankind's history, vitamin D deficiency was not much of a problem. Not so now, since most of us spend most of our time inside, since we wear a lot more clothes, and since a lot of us live in northern attitudes, um, out uh, latitudes. As I mentioned before, vitamin D is associated with several cardiovascular processes, it appears that the higher vitamin D level is in a person, the lower their systolic blood pressure, lower vascular resistance, lower arterial intimal medial thickness, increased sensitivity and secretion of insulin, lower lipids, benefits on myocardial contractility, and decreased inflammatory cytokines. And there are a lot of um, well-defined uh, physiologic me mechanisms why this might be. To go over each one in detail would be a series of lectures to take up our whole morning, but these aren't just hypotheses or speculations. There have been many, many brilliant scientists over the years that have studied um, the relationship of vitamin D to all of these cardiovascular processes. Moving to the study that we did, and I hope that you will feel that this is a practical study that's applicable to what you're going to be doing in your uh, practice in the people that you deal with and that you're advising. There's just some of the basics. We decided that the optimal concentration for 25-hydroxy vitamin D was at least 30 nanograms per milliliter or greater. Across the board, in most of the literature that we reviewed, several, several hundred articles, this was the standard level that's been used to assess whether or not you're vitamin D deficient or not. And that's the, the criteria that we use as a cutoff in our study. Um, vitamin D deficiency by, in our study was defined as a, le as, a, a, as a level less than 20 and insufficiency from 21 to 29. And we made that cutoff, as I said, as normal or abnormal based on a value of uh, 30. We looked at serum vitamin D measurements over five years and nine months here at the University of Kansas Hospital. These weren't from some other side. These weren't taken from the national database. These are the people that I've seen over the years that you folks have probably seen over the years also. Uh, we got these from um, the uh, clinical laboratory here, thanks to Dr. Leroy Telser for helping us get them. 
They were matched to patient demographic, physiologic, and disease state variables from our cardiovascular database that we've maintained for the past 15 years and provided in de-identified format. So all HIPAA compliance algorithms were followed precisely. I knew nobody's name. Um, a couple weeks back, I was interviewed by Channel 4 regarding this research and wanted to know if we could have some of the patients from the study interviewed to, to talk about their experience. And I said, well, I don't know any of their names. You know, I can speculate. And I can tell you patients of mine who are taking vitamin D, but uh, I had no knowledge of the individual patient name. There were a total of nearly 25,000 samples tested in the laboratory at this hospital over that five year, nine month period. Unique patients, over 14,000. In other words, several patients had more than one value done, most likely pre and post replacement. Uh, I arbitrarily chose to take the lowest values that probably reflected the people in steady state. Database query yield of information on 11, a little over 11,000 patients. We excluded those that were less than 18 years of age because the likelihood they have cardiovascular diseases would be extremely small. And we ended up still with nearly 11,000 patients, 11,000 patients that we analyzed for vitamin D status and relationship to disease processes. And the laboratory assay did not change over this period. The data was then clean and formatted to allow statistical analysis. This is where my Epidemiology professors got to have a high time uh, making me do and redo the statistics several dozen times. We used SAS, a very standard and well accepted statistical program, and, and performed all the appropriate statistical analysis to look at the data and to also be sure that, that our outcomes and our conclusions were valid. We're always supposed to set up null and alternative hypotheses, right? That's the basis of the scientific method. And usually you're trying to disprove the null and then accept the alternative. And so the null is what you're trying to dis disprove, and that would be that vitamin D levels are not associated with cardiovascular outcomes and survival. The alternative, what I wanted to demonstrate, was that they were that vitamin D levels were associated with cardiac outcomes as well as survival, and similar sort of algorithm for vitamin D replacement. And throughout we use the standard 0.5 level of significance. Well, of these patients, the mean age was 58, plus or minus about 15 years, so kind of your standard middle-aged population, characteristic of the hospital and outpatient uh, population here. And I should mention that this was the hospital clinical lab, but a lot of these were outpatient uh, vitamin D levels that were drawn from the internist and the specialist to see folks in the clinics here. The distribution was normal, and you want to assure that to make sure that you can apply the appropriate statistical analyses. Um, a little over 70% were women, and that may be due in part to the number of women followed in the osteoporosis and bone clinics here. The mean weight was about 185 pounds, again, 186 pounds, again, unfortunately, characteristic of much of the middle-aged population in this country. So put a few of these factors in mind, the mean age of this patient population, the mean weight, BMI nearly 30, so that's the upper limit of overweight. Sadly, that's how a lot of folks uh, are in this country at this, uh, in, at this point in time. And the average ejection fraction was 52%. Um, I'll just tell you, a lot of you know that that's a normal ejection fraction. A normal ejection fraction is 55 to 60%. So these were, this was not a population that only consisted of sick people with bad heart failure who spend all of their time inside and have a ultra diet, this was a population that had, had a normal ejection fraction. Um, vitamin D levels, I was astonished when we did the initial analysis and the v mean vitamin D level is 24 nanograms per milliliter. So on the average, people were in the abnormal range, certainly in the borderline going on the deficient range. The median was 22.5. It was skewed to the right, which means there was a long tail of some people who had high levels, probably on high dose replacement. So only about 30% of people were in normal range. Only 30% were in normal range. Now, again, this is a population middle-aged, living in a, in a, a northern climate, but it, I think, highlights how many people, by a standard utilized criteria, are abnormal in regards to their sealed vitamin D levels. We first compared some basic um, parameters between the two groups. People who 
were not vitamin D deficient versus those that were deficient. And for many, many disease processes, it ended up that the people who were deficient had a higher, institute, higher incidence of, of, of abnormalities. Cardiomyopathy was higher in the people who were deficient. Creatinine levels were higher. Interestingly, uh, uh, calcium levels were uh, lower in the deficient people, not unexpectedly. Uh, being Having a normal vitamin D level probably um, uh, resulted in a, in a higher calcium level. Possibly because more people who were not deficient were on supplements, so it was probably a good thing to be on supplements, or at least there was some relationship between being on calcium supplements and not being vitamin D deficient. BMI, again, the heavier you are, the more likely you were to be vitamin D deficient, and that's been recognized um, in other studies also. Ejection fraction is the same, so again, we weren't separating just by pre existing severe cardiac disease. But um, uh, uh, diabetes was more common in the deficient people. Uh, uh, women were more likely to not be deficient. Death, and this was probably the most uh, striking thing to me, but death was more common to a significant level, a highly significant level in the deficient patients. Blood pressure tended to be higher in deficient patients. LDL levels, the bad cholesterol was higher. Um, that wasn't because statin use was different, because statins were used in exactly the same percentage of patients in the two groups. Triglyceride levels were higher if you were tr deficient. Um, vitamin D levels, not surprisingly, like, of course, they'd be higher in the folks who weren't deficient. More people who are deficient were on supplements. That's as it should be, but still having only 32% of people who are deficient on were deficient being on supplements suggests that there would be a lot more work for us to do. Well, coronary artery disease risk factors, to summarize that long table, if you're vitamin D deficient, you are more likely to have hypertension, diabetes, to be a male, to have hyperlipidemia, all of these being risk factors for coronary artery disease. Now, this doesn't necessarily represent cause and effect, but this consistency of association certainly should raise uh, concern and interest. Going to the more detailed statistic, univariate analysis, the odds ratio of an, of an event, the likelihood of an event being present over that five-year, nine-month period of our study, if you were vitamin D deficient, uh, you were more likely to die. You were more likely to have coronary artery disease. You were more likely to have diabetes, cardiomyopathy, and hypertension. All of these were statistically significant. In other words, being vitamin D deficient was not a good group to be in. This does not prove cardiac cause and effect. This is association, but nevertheless compelling, compelling evidence that being vitamin D deficient is not a good state for a person to be in. The question is, if is being replaced, can that turn these negative attributes around? Looking at um, relationship to death, what factors, what clinical factors, and these are patients who are going to be walking into your office, what clinical factors might alert you to being at high risk of death? Well, certainly if a person has coronary artery disease, you're more likely to have a cardiac event and follow-up. Diabetes, cardiomyopathy, all of these are negative predictors for good outcomes. They're predictors of reduced survival and higher mortality. Interestingly, one of the highest uh, uh, risk predictors was vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency was in the same realm as having coronary artery disease or cardiomyopathy as a risk factor. So just with that one simple lab test, you can, you can risk profile your patient as to what their possibility of mortality is, at least based on, again, this five-plus year period of our study. Stepwise selection, that's a way of seeing which of these variables are significant and which are not, which may be confounders with other variables. And all of those variables I mentioned were retained in our logistic regression model, including vitamin D. The C value is a marker of goodness of fit. And I'll just tell you that a C value of 0.734 suggests that the model is an accurate one and not prone to errors or bias. How about just looking at vitamin D levels as a continuous variable, not abnormal or not, because you might say, maybe there's a problem with the cutoff. If we look at the more recent Institute of Medicine uh, a statement that came out, they said we should use a cutoff of 20 rather than 30. 
our data would suggest that it doesn't matter where that level is, there's a continuous relationship of mortality with vitamin D. And with the odds ratio being less than one, being 0.95, the higher your vitamin D level is, the lower your risk of death is. So that suggested to me that even using vitamin D as a categorical, or as a continuous variable, not just a categorical yes or no, suggests that it does have an impact based on the actual level, not just normal or abnormal. And again, doing the same statistical processing, uh, all five of the variables, including vitamin D deficiency, was retained in the model, and the C value actually became stronger, suggesting that, that this association was retained as a powerful predictor of death just based on vitamin D level, not based on any potentially arbitrary cutoff point. We can see maybe, maybe those initial results are biased because he didn't include enough clinical attributes of the patient. So, and, and, and again, my professors tried, you know, part of the learning process was doing different modeling, and in this case, besides the disease models we used before we added age, uh, BMI, ejection fraction, creatinine, gender, vitamin D deficiency was retained as a very strong predictor, a, a 2.4 increase in odds ratio of death over that period of the study uh, if you were deficient versus if you were not. Not surprisingly, being a, a woman resulted in a, in a decreased risk and again, most of the other clinical variables were retained as, as being significant. There was some confounding, like between coronary artery disease and age. The older you are, the more likely you, you are to have coronary artery disease. But introducing these other clinical factors did not reduce or negate the impact of being vitamin D deficient as a negative predictor of mortality. We looked at survival a couple of ways. Uh, the survival method one, looking from the time of birth to the time of death or the end of the study, and then matching this with the Social Security Death Index. This is the standard way of looking at overall mortality, and our computer people were able to make that match, again, providing it to me in de-identified format, but seeing which patients have passed away over the course of the study. And the, the black um, uh, bars, black uh, uh, curve are people who are not deficient, the red curve are the folks who are deficient, and again you can see uh, over the course of the study that if you're vitamin D deficient you had an increasing propensity to mortality, worse survival than if you were, were not deficient, and again the not deficient folks are the black curve. The second method of survival we looked at, and probably the more statistically valid, is just to look over the period of the study. In other words, not from uh, birth till death, but from the time that we started collecting the data until the end. And so it was, again, a five-month, uh, a five-year, nine-month period, or until death. And here again, I, it showed a significant separation. Black bar, again, being not be deficient. Red bar, folks who were deficient. The scale of this initial output wasn't very good. It was all kind of compressed, but there was clear separation throughout the uh, period of the study. And I apologize for how poorly this was reproduced, but if you change the scale of the study, so this is about 90 down here, 90 to 100, it demonstrates more clearly how the curve separated with the survival advantage to not being deficient. Hazard function analysis is a way of looking at survival, putting in other, in other variables, just to see if there's something else that may be affecting survival based on vitamin D deficiency, maybe other disease states. But uh, looking, at, looking at that, vitamin D deficiency was retained as a very significant predictor of poor survival. Uh, even though uh, we entered in coronary artery disease, diabetes, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, in fact, it was the most potent predictor of, um, of survival in the hazards model. We redid it, putting in those other clinical variables such as age, gender, ejection fraction, BMI, and again, vitamin D remained the variable with the highest odds ratio of impact on survival. Uh, doing the same thing for survival method two, just to make sure that, that it wasn't some bias introduced in looking over a person's lifetime, rather just the period of the study. Again, deficiency remained a very high uh, predictor of, of reduced survival. The last thing, 
analysis is something that could be done about it or in this way influence or impact of being on supplements. These chi-square tables can be kind of tough to look at. Um, I just want to draw your attention. This, the column are people who are on vitamin D uh, 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 replacement, and the, and the rows are people who are deficient or not. So the first row are people who are not deficient, and 21% of them were on vitamin D replacement. If you were deficient, nearly 32% were on replacement. And I showed this to you in the univariate table earlier. It's good news to know that we're recognizing at least some of the people who are deficient, but there's clearly the majority of people who are deficient who are uh, not on supplementation. The question is, is that important or not? And, and I think many of us on the faculty at the Medical Center here do too. I suspect many of you do also. Uh, what we have to deal with is the public response or question about the, intro, about the Institute of Medicine guidelines that, or position statement that came out recently. When we looked at whether or not deficiency had an impact on death stratifying by vitamin D replacement, if you were on supplements, and this is a key thing I think and maybe the most important part of our analysis, if you were vitamin D deficient but on supplements, your odds ratio of death dropped from those prior values of 2 to 2.5 down to 1.46, which was not statistically significant. But if you weren't supplemented, if you were deficient or not supplemented, in our study, that was a really bad situation to be in because your odds ratio of mortality was nearly four times above baseline. And again, we've done different statistical testing to demonstrate that, that there was a true difference between these strata, supplemented or not, but it appeared that being supplemented um, uh, reduced your uh, odds ratio of mortality nearly to baseline. Not being on supplements left you in bad shape. Could there be a relationship between these outcomes and supplements? Well, yeah, that's, I think that's what the hypothesis was to assure that there wasn't some confounding going on. My statistical professors had me generate an interaction statement to see if there truly was an impact of, uh, of being deficient in supplementation. So I developed an interaction term, substituted put in all of the models I, that I had done to see whether or not uh, significance was retained. In general, adding this term resulted in vitamin D supplementation becoming a non-significant factor, while vitamin D deficiency and the interaction term was highly significant. Interpreting that, again, if you're deficient, it's really important to be on supplements. If you're not deficient, it probably does not matter. And I think we'd agree with that, that if you're not, if you, not deficient of any um, nutrient or, or substance that, that is appropriate for health, additional replacement probably does not have additive benefit. And this just shows that, uh, as, as I demonstrated early on, that, that modeling individual vitamin D deficiency and supplementation were independent predictors. If you were deficient, you had a higher, ha high, higher odds hazards ratio of death. One is normal. 3.75 a significant increase. If you're on supplements, it was reduced. It was about half what baseline would be. If you put the interaction term in, it was significant. It's vitamin D supplementation itself was not. And if you only had the interaction term, uh, it was highly significant. So again, being on replacement was important if you were deficient, not if you had a normal level of baseline defined as greater than 30. Again, I, I won't drag you through this, but this was uh, detailed statistical, statistical modeling to demonstrate that our conclusions were valid. In most models, the outcomes and auto ratios were similar whether or not the interaction of terminal vitamin D replacement was included. Uh, in ultimate modeling, I just included vitamin D replacement because I think it's easier to understand, and certainly if you try to interpret this study or similar ones for public consumption. If we added vitamin D supplementation to the degrees re disease regression model for death, vitamin D supplementation reduced the odds ratio of mortality over our study period substantially. If the interaction term was used again, the odds ratio was about the same, again, suggesting the equivalence in ultimate modeling using either of these two. This shows survival by vitamin D supplementation. In this case, the red curve, the red curve are people on supplements. The black curve, people not on supplements. 
And so it, the people on supplements have better survival outcome. The final logistic regression model for death, and, you, and if you're going to risk profile people, you like to take all the different risk factors that you looked at and filter down to only the important ones, separating out those that aren't significant. And so probably did about 20 different iterations with different factors in or out, seeing what might be important. And again, using and developing this interaction term was a big part of the process. Um, the final model for death, uh, there was missing data for some of the variables. Um, we, I s attempted to assess collinearity, which means influence of other factors upon the ones that may be uh, truly significantly important, by like correlation analysis and linear regression techniques, and then did detailed goodness of fit and classification testing. In other words, the model that we derived, how well does it predict um, uh, outcomes? And so the final model included vitamin D deficiency, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy as positive factors for poor outcome, reduced survival. Being a woman and being on vitamin D supplementations were positive factors for protective things. So most of these people, you have a head start on us guys in regards to outcomes if you take care of yourself in, in other ways. Looking at vitamin D as a continuous variable, and I chose this rather than my analysis of the cutoff of normal abnormal, maybe it's a response to the Institute of Medicine guideline. But looking at vitamin D as a continuous variable in the final model, the model is highly significant. The C value, again, goodness of fit was, um, was uh, a very strong indeed. And this showed how the model classified people. If we used the model, these were the expected people who would be classified as survivors or not. And in most cases, these numbers are very, very equivalent. This is about as good as you can do when you do predictive modeling based on, on regression, regression analysis. In some of the groups, the numbers predicted by the model versus the actual outcomes were almost exactly the same. So I felt comfortable that our model of survival, the predictors of poor outcome, actually were was accurate and related to real, real life. I mentioned before, if analyzed separately, patients with vitamin D deficient benefited from supplementation of the regression model, while those who are not deficient did not. Uh, vitamin D deficient patients on supplements did not have an increased risk of death. In other words, those people on supplements who were deficient ended up having their survival return to baseline. But if not on supplements, their deficiency is a powerful predictor of reduced survival. In the study, as you saw earlier from some of the uh, um, univariate outcomes, vitamin D deficiency was associated with, with several powerful coronary artery disease risk factors, higher BMI, lower or higher LDL cholesterol, lower HDL cholesterol, higher triglycerides. Something that, that comes up in a study like this, you can say maybe the people taking supplements just live a high, uh, healthier lifestyle, right? And that's that's a potential bias of many survey types of studies. That if you look at, at people's outcomes, a lot of times it relates to the type of life they live. Do they exercise more? Do they intake fewer animal fats? Do they maintain a better body weight? Do they take uh, other medications that may improve their outcomes? And so we looked at whether there's an influence of any vitamin supplement, statins, which we know have uniformly been shown in multiple studies to have uh, positive uh, survival outcomes and use of aspirin. Aspirin has been promoted for years as something to reduce cardiovascular events and maybe also other beneficial health things also. But when we put these other variables in, it did not change the impact of vitamin D. So just because you lived healthy and took your medicines, took a multivitamin supplement, took your stats and took a daily aspirin, that did not negate the benefit of um, vitamin D supplementation. When we looked at vitamin D replacement and putting any vitamin use in the model, the person just told us in the office, told our nurses and med techs, yes, I take a vitamin, uh, probably most were multivitamins, but, but um, taking any vitamin did not um, uh, result in reduced uh, uh, risk of death. In fact, it was a negative predictor, showed an increased uh, um, uh, outcome of death per survival, whereas vitamin D supplementation had a powerful uh, 
protective effect. So just being on a multivitamin, and remember, most multivitamins on the average have about 400 IUs of vitamin D, right? I know the one I took for years, have taken for years, did, at least up until recently. Some had 200, but, but to me it was impressive that for people taking multivitamins, um, that amount of vitamin D did not appear to confer a protective effect. It was only the people who took additional supplementation. Um, statin and aspirin use. Um, it was no surprise that statins had a powerful positive uh, outcome on prolonging survival, but it did not cause vitamin D supplementation to drop out. Vitamin D supplementation retained its benefit even in people who were on statins. Interestingly, aspirin did not. And some of you may already think of why that might be true. First of all, aspirin has more benefit and certainly proven benefit in men, not so in women. It's, it's fairly reasonable to tell a man above age 50 to take a daily low-dose aspirin. There's not a lot of strong data to recommend that in women. And remember, 71% of the patients in our study were women. So not, <coughs> excuse me, not a total surprise that aspirin was not a positive um, uh, survival predictor. Conclusions, at least conclusions, I'm not going to let you go quite yet, but conclusions for, the, uh, for my research part of this talk that I'm presenting to you, that vitamin D is a, is a significant risk factor for several cardiovascular disease states. Vitamin D deficiency is a significant independent predictor of reduced survival. I believe that even after the recent release by the IOM. I do believe that vitamin D supplementation is associated with better survival in deficient patients. And again, I, I say uh, risk factors and I say association. I'm not saying cause and effect, but the association to me is very potent. So if you look at the hypotheses that I postulated early on in the talk, I think that I will reject the null hypotheses and accept the alternative hypotheses that vitamin D levels are associated with cardiovascular outcomes and survival, and likewise, vitamin D replacement has a positive impact on cardiovascular outcomes and survival. There are other people going to talk more about calcium, uh, but I'll just mention to you that uh, mean calcium levels in survivors were 9.23, in non-survivors 8.89. These are both within normal range, but again, it was of interest to me that, that I'm sorry, the calcium levels were a, a little bit higher significantly so in survival. So having a higher calcium level, be it by the way you're made or by calcium supplementation, um, did not, uh, did not uh, uh, negatively impact outcome. In fact, the people with higher levels fell in the survivor group by logistic regression. Again, this was a significantly, uh, this was a statistically significant difference. Calcium supplements in death, and this is maybe the key thing. Now, our study wasn't designed to specifically look at this, and this is something that, that Raj and I are, are interested in examining our database in more detail, but at least by initial analysis, our patients on calcium supplements did not have a higher incidence of death, either by chi-square analysis or by logistic regression, and this odds ratio means that there's essentially no impact of supplementation on death. So there's a lot more statistics we have to do on this, but I don't, I don't have a concern that in our population here at this hospital uh, in Kansas that we are hurting our patients by having them on calcium supplementation, at least for this patient population as defined in my study. Limitations of the study, and these are things that are present, I think, in most um, uh, retrospective survey um, uh, studies such as this, but I do not believe or um, invalidate the outcomes. We're well, well aware of the pros and cons of the analysis we did and the restrictions of our population. It strikes me, and I agree with, with Adele Davis, that thousands and thousands of persons have studied disease. Almost no one has studied health. And at this stage in my career, and I think for many of you folks too, you're probably more interested in promoting health than the people you see, and that's true for me. I've got a ton of very aggressive, active, hungry young partners who love to do angioplasties and, and, and love to do interventions. And I did those things also for many years. But at, at this stage, I'm really interested in prevention and promotion of health. 
And that's my main area of interest at this point that led to this investigation. Vitamin D deficiency in public health. Well, the association of vitamin D deficiency with coronary artery disease, risk factor, several cardiovascular disease states, and reduced survival constitute a potential widespread public health risk, particularly as deficiency is quite common. This isn't just from our study. This is from many studies done around the world and in this country. Um, uh, so don't, so I'm not asking you to just take what we've done here. But this is part of a growing body of evidence that suggests that vitamin D deficiency is a major health problem. Maybe not for folks living in equatorial Africa who are outside a lot, have much more continuous exposure. Um, but for people in our climate, our, our um, patient populations that we see, and with our lifestyles, I think it is a significant problem. Suggestions, population-based screening, and oral supplementation programs. Uh, my recommendation is still for most folks to take 1,000 to 2,000 IU international units daily. Recommending increased sun exposure is problematic due to the cancer risk. I, I just find it hard to tell people that you have to uh, systematically and continue, continue and throughout your life um, expose yourself for more sun as a primary way of getting vitamin D. I spent years of my life in the sun, had paper roots, worked in my dad's garden, was a postman. I like to run, I like to be outside, and I pay the price by having several squamous cells and basal cells removed. It's no fun, and, and you're worried. I've had friends who have been stricken with melanoma. So you just can't, I don't think we can recommend that. So I use sunscreen all the time. I think many of us, many, not most of us, hopefully are prudent to do that if we spend our time outside for sun exposed areas. A comment on the dosing. You know, like I said, vitamin, this was the last bottle of, of one a day that I bought, and it had 400 international units of vitamin D. And when I got, it, it's just about empty. So I got a refill bottle, so I run it run out. I was surprised to see that the new dose is 700 IUs. One a day, men's formula, now it's up to 700. I think the same thing for women's formula. For those of you women or men who might take calcium supplements or, or chondroitin, hyaluronidase supplements. Most of them now, it wasn't true three years ago, but most of them have vitamin D in also. So it's pretty easy if you take a multivitamin, you take some calcium supplements, and maybe you take something else because you're developing some DJD, that you might already be on one, two, or maybe 3,000 IUs of vitamin D. So be careful. Look at what's on your bottles to see, but it's clearly different clearly different than it was just a few years back when this method of supplementation was not as aggressive. One of the problems that we have dealing with, I think, talking to this about patients, and I've had feedback, I've got feedback from my kids about this, talking because they, they heard about this and that was kind of cool that dad went back to school, but he said, you know, you used to say take more vitamin C, and then it was vitamin E for a while, and then folic acid and beta carotene. And in all those cases, the more detailed analysis of, of, st of study has not demonstrated cardiovascular benefit. In fact, little health benefit over and above baseline intake. I guess my argument, argument would be none of them had the background information and study over the course of years that vitamin D have. None of them, and none of them have there been outcomes similar to our study as well as other ones from other centers. Omega-3 fatty acids, I mean, those are most likely good things, but again, if you're telling a person to take their regular medicines plus take omega-3s plus vitamin D, you say, oh my gosh, how much is too much? And we've been telling people everybody should take a daily aspirin. Well, probably not. Probably middle-aged and older. The data is much better for men than it is for women. But all of this, I think, tends to kind of get people tired of hearing about there's yet something else that I ought to be taking. And this is the this is the thing that's kind of um, uh, raised some challenges in regards to how all of us are going to deal with our patients and recommendations. And I've got to thank Dr. Bhattacharya for raising my awareness for this, and Dennis McCall from the hospital um, uh, 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 promotions and publicity department sent this by because kind of in response to this recent TV thing. But this was an institute of medicine set of guidelines and review that just came out hot off the press. 
if you, this is the document you're most likely to read, it's about eight pages. But if you look at the full documents, they run to over uh, 60 pages, and it's tough reading. Just can take a few minutes when we wrap things up to try to, try to give you an overview of this. First, they're, um, they're, uh, uh, what they used as kind of guidelines or outlines, the estimated average requirement, what they think that human beings need, the recommended daily allowance so that the majority of people within, that looks like two standard deviations, Actually, yeah, two standard deviations are going to get enough. And then the tolerable upper intake level where they feel raising above that may increase the risk of side effects, complications, toxicity. Well, first they had a long list of potential indicators of how the outcomes from nutrient efficacy of calcium and vitamin D. Huge list. And these are things that have been of interest and studied over the years. I found it kind of interesting that they, that they mushed together calcium vitamin D in here. Now, I'm, I'm not promoting increasing calcium for cardiovascular health, just vitamin D, and that was the purpose of our study, but they mushed these things together. Even though there's tons of evidence and data, some of it's come over the years from the bone metabolism, people here in the endocrine, endocrine department showing benefits of vitamin D. So I was really uncomfortable that they put all these things together, and, and I think it's um, you know, for some things there may be evidence pro or con, but there's strong investigational outcomes from many of these things that suggest that um, having adequate levels of vitamin D and possibly calcium are beneficial in regards to optimal health. And they list these things kind of with the idea that this is nebulous or uncertain, which really isn't true for many of them. For many of them, there's a huge body of supporting evidence over the course of many years. Again, potential indicators of adverse outcomes from excess intake of calcium and vitamin D. I'm not going to comment on the, on the calcium aspects. I mean, we know that being above physiologic range for calcium can cause some problems. To lump vitamin D in the same level is a little bit problematic, because it's hard to find, at least in the adult population, I can't speak to infants, of evidence of clear-cut vitamin D toxicity or ne negative outcomes. It just, you know, for the number of people we have been on replacement with levels up, with doses up to 50,000 IUs for weeks and then higher levels on an ongoing basis. Um, I just don't think that there's, that there's strong evidence, to, and I, they do say potential, but I think this is going to scare a lot of people, and they almost add this as being a negative aspect on alcohol cause mortality, cardiovascular, falls and frasca. I think what they're trying to say that we're still looking at the subjects, but certainly not that they are promoting these entities. So it, it can be a little confusing. But this, is, this table is directly cut and pasted from the PDF document that came out. Then they say this population segments and conditions of interest. What the heck does that mean, conditions of interest? I think they're trying to say these are populations where their guidelines may be, maybe don't cover things adequately, and there's more more study needed, or adiposity. What was the average weight in BMI of patients in our study, and what's characteristic of middle-aged people in this country? So maybe those people do need more, and their recommendations may not be directly applicable. Persons living at high upper latitudes in North America, again, that's where we are, where our patients are, that's where New York City is, that's where Chicago is, that's where a ton of people in this country live. And again, this table is directly taken from their document, but I think may be misinterpreted. Why didn't they say these are populations where we're not sure what the right dose of vitamin D is? Persons who experience reduced vitamin D synthesis from sun exposure. I would propose to you that that's a huge number of adults in this country as well as other developed nations. Uh, dark skin from whatever immigrant groups, use of sunscreen, which most people should be using, and indoor environments and institutionalized older persons. Well, guess what? Most of us work in indoor environments, right? So, at any rate, I, I think that there's still a lot of questions raised by this, and if they say, okay, you have to look at these populations and maybe redefine our recommendations, that's what we should at least consider. If, the, if more study comes out, that's great. Their bottom line recommendations, were that the recommended daily allowance, or, the, or they felt the estimated uh, 
metabolic needs on the average, on the average is 400 IUs daily. The recommended daily allowance, and they don't make a big deal about this, but they actually recommend now that, that, that you take, most people take 600, and that people above the age of 70 may need as much as 800. So you're getting a lot closer to the dosage range that I think many of us at the medical center recommend for our patients. So if you read this document, it's important to read it carefully. Uh, recognize that they're recommending higher dosages than they have previously, as well as recognition that there's some patient subgroups that may require even more. Certainly, the older folks is pretty much a gimme, I think. Yes, we have to be realistic that, uh, and this is true, Dr. Fisher had an interesting series of statements over the years, but, but we do have to be careful. It's not just flushing our medicines down the toilet so they get into our reservoir water and, and, and our animals, can, but, you know, half the modern drugs could be thrown out the window except the birds might eat them. We don't want to subject the birds to some of these things. Well, that's, that's it. I want to thank you for your attention. Hopefully I raised some questions for you, maybe answered a few. You know, keep alert for ongoing public uh, publications and public pronouncements. Try to do it with a grain of salt and, and keep open-minded. I mean, I'm not personally invested in this. I want to do what the right thing is for my patients. I'll just tell you, in spite of all my sun exposure, all my, you know, I, I mowed three acres of lawn during the summer, I was deficient. My vitamin B D when I was checked, I was 22. I have hypertension, I have hyperlipidemia, so I got put on replacement and had it rechecked. I take 200 a day, uh, uh, 2,000 a day, in addition to a multivitamin, but it got myself back in the therapeutic range. So I still recommend that for most of my patients. We're going to have a ton of questions uh, over the next few weeks. I know that, and um, uh, after this, I've got to run and do a little bit of work. I'm going to, I'm going to come back for the panel discussion, um, so I, you know, and, and certainly be happy to any question, answer any questions, any of you might have at any time, email, phone call, I'd be interested in your outlooks, and if you want to argue, that's fine, if you want to cheer together on, but, you know, I, I hope we stay open-minded, and that and the bottom line is improving public health and, and that of the individual patients that we care for, you know, I think nothing else matters, we've got to take ego out of this, and, and uh, Try to make sure that we can really stay alert for how this area evolves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vacek. And we are on target with our schedule, and therefore, if you're very good and you may take a comfort or stretch break uh, while we set up for the next speaker, don't make that longer than five minutes. Uh, if you'll give the KU dietetic interns a moment, I think they'll pull some yogurt and uh, some uh, milk from uh, with the coolers underneath the tables. Uh, if you'd like to, to have that, uh, do exit both doors, and then we won't have a traffic jam. So see you back in five minutes.